Welcome back to Cross the Border, another Christian history segment. We'll be continuing our series on John Wycliffe, and this time, his battle for English independence from Rome. This from J. A. Wiley's History of Protestantism. When England began to resist the papacy, it began to grow in power and wealth. Loosening its neck from the yoke of Rome, it lifted up its head proudly among the nations. Innocent III, crowning a series of usurpations by the submission of King John, an act of baseness that stood alone in the annals of English history, had sustained himself master of the kingdom. But the great pontiff was bidden, somewhat gruffly, to stand off. The northern nobles, who knew little about theology, but cared a great deal for independence, would be masters of their own isle, and they let the haughty wearer of the tiara know this when they framed Magna Carta. Turning to King John, they told him, in effect, that if he was to be the slave of an Italian priest, he could not be the master of Norman barons. The tide once turned continued to flow. The two famous statutes of provisors and premunire were enacted. These were a sort of double breastwork. The first was meant to keep out the flood of usurpations that was setting in from Rome upon England, and the second was intended to close the door against the tithes, revenues, appeals, and obedience which were flowing in an ever-growing stream from England to the Vatican. Great Britain had never before performed an act of resistance to the papacy, but with it came a quickening of her energies and a strengthening of her liberty. This was the moment chosen by Urban V to advance his insolent demand. How often have the popes failed to read the signs of the times? Urban had signally failed to do so. The nation, though still submitting to the spiritual burdens of Rome, was becoming restive under her supremacy and pecuniary extractions. The Parliament had entered on a course of legislation to set bounds to these avaricious encroachments. The King, too, was getting sore at this defacing of the ancient laws and spoiling of his crown. And with the laurels of Cresci on his brow, he was in no mood for repairing to Rome, as Urban commanded and paying down a thousand marks for permission to wear the crown, which he was so well able to defend with his sword. Edward assembled his parliament in 1366, laying the Pope's letter before it. He bade them to take counsel and say what answer should be returned. Give us, said the estates of the realm, a day to think over the matter. The king willingly granted them that space of time. They assembled again on the morrow, prelates, lords, and commons. Shall England, now becoming mistress of the seas, bow at the feet of the Pope? It is a great crisis. We eagerly scan the faces of the council, for the future of England hangs on its resolve. Shall the, nature in, shall the nation retrograde to the days of John? Or shall it go forward to even higher glory than it has achieved under Edward? Wycliffe was present on that occasion, and has preserved a summary of the speeches. The record is interesting as perhaps the earliest reported debate in Parliament, and still more interesting from the gravity of the issues depending thereon. A military baron is the first to rise. The kingdom of England, he said, opening the debate, was won by the sword, and by that sword has been defended. Let the Pope then gird on his sword and come and try to exact his tribute by force, and I, for one, am ready to resist him. This is not spoken like an obedient son of the church, but all the more a loyal subject of England, scarcely more encouraging to the supporters of the papal claim, was a speech of the second baron. He only, he said, is entitled to secular tribute who legitimately exercises secular rule. 
and is able to give secular protection. The Pope cannot legitimately do either. He is a minister of the gospel, not a temporal ruler. His duty is to give ghostly counsel, not corporal protection. Let us see that he abide within the limits of his spiritual office, where we shall obey him. But if he shall choose to transgress these limits, he must take the consequences. The Pope, said a third, following in the line of the second speaker, calls himself the servant of the servants of God. Very well. He can claim recompense only for service done. But where are the services which he renders to this land? Does he minister to us in spirituals? Does he help us in temporals? Does he not rather greedily drain our treasures, and often for the benefit of our enemies? I give my voice against this tribute. On what grounds was this tribute originally demanded? asked another. Was it not for absolving King John and relieving the kingdom from interdict? But to bestow spiritual benefits for money is sheer simony. It is a piece of ecclesiastical swindling. Let the Lord's spiritual and temporal wash their hands of a transaction so disgraceful. But if it is as futile superior of the kingdom that the Pope demands this tribute, why ask a thousand marks? Why not ask the throne, the soil, and the people of England? If his title be good for these thousand marks, it is good for a great deal more. The Pope, on the same principle, may declare the throne vacant, and fill it with whomsoever he pleases. Pope Urban tells us, so spoke another, that all kingdoms are Christ, and that he as vicar holds England for Christ. But as the Pope is peccable and may abuse his trust, it appears to me that it were better that we should hold our land directly and alone for Christ. Let us, said the last speaker, go at once to the root of the matter. King John had no right to gift away the kingdom of England without the consent of the nation. That consent was never given. The golden seal of the king and the seals of the few nobles whom John persuaded or coerced to join him in this transaction do not constitute the national consent. If John gifted his subjects to innocent, like so many chattels, Innocent may come and take his property if he can. We, the people of England, had no voice in the matter. We hold the bargain null and void from the beginning. So spake Edward III's Parliament. Not a voice was raised in support of the arrogant demand of Urban. Prelate, Baron, and Commoner united in repudiating it as insulting to England and these men expressed themselves in that plain, brief, and pithy language which betokens deep conviction as well as determined resolution. If need were, these bold words would be followed by deeds equally bold. The hands of the barons were on the hilts of their swords as they uttered them. They were, in the first place, subjects of England, and in the second place, members of the Church of Rome. The Pope accounts no one a good Catholic who does not reverse this order and put his spiritual above his temporal allegiance, his church before his country. This firm attitude of the Parliament put an end to the matter. The question which Urban had really raised was this, and nothing less than this, shall the Pope or the King be sovereign over England? The answer of the Parliament was, not the Pope, but the King. And from that hour, the claim of the former was not again advanced, at least in explicit terms. The decision at which the Parliament arrived was unanimous. It reproduced in brief both the argument and the spirit of the speeches. Few such replies were in those days carried to the foot of the papal throne. For as much, so ran the decision of the three estates of the realm, as neither King John nor any other king could bring his realm and kingdom into such thraldom and subjection, but by common assent of Parliament, 
the which was not given, therefore that which he did was against his oath at his coronation, besides many other causes. If therefore the Pope should attempt anything against the king by process, or other matters indeed, the king, with all his subjects, should with all their force and power resist the same. Thus far in England, in the middle of the 14th century, advanced on the road to the Reformation. The estates of the realm had unanimously repudiated one of the two great branches of the papacy. The dogma of vicarship binds up the spiritual and the temporal in one anomalous jurisdiction. England had denied the latter, and this was a step towards questioning and finally repudiating the former. It was quite natural that the nation should first discover the falsity of the temporal supremacy before seeing the equal falsity of the spiritual. Urban had put the matter in a light in which no one could possibly mistake it. In demanding payment of a thousand marks annually, he translated, as we say, the theory of the temporal supremacy into a palpable fact. The theory might have passed a little longer without question had it not been put into this ungracious form. The halo which encompassed the papal fabric during the Middle Ages began to wane, and men took courage to criticize a system whose immense prestige had blinded them hitherto. Such was the state of mind of the English nation. Its reformation was not far off. Wycliffe had greatly and mainly contributed to bring about this state of mind in England. He had been the teacher of barons and commons. He had propounded these doctrines from his chair at Oxford before they were proclaimed by the assembled estates of the realm. But for the spirit and views with which he had been quietly leavening the nation, the demand of Urban might have been met with a different reception. It would not, we believe, have been complied with. The position England had now attained in Europe, and the deference paid her by foreign nations, would have made submission impossible. But without Wycliffe, the resistance would not have been placed on so intelligible a ground, nor would it have been urged with so resolute a patriotism. The firm attitude assumed effectually extinguished the hopes of the Vatican and rid England ever after of all such irritating and insolent demands. That Wycliffe's position in this controversy was already a prominent one, and that the sentiments expressed in Parliament were but the echo of his teaching at Oxford are attested by an event which then took place. The Pope found a supporter in England, though not in the Parliament, a monk whose name has not come down to us, stood forward to demonstrate the righteousness of the claim of Urban V. This controversialist laid down the fundamental position that, as vicar of Christ, the Pope is the feudal superior of the monarchs and the Lord paramount of their kingdoms. Thence he deduced the following conclusion, that all sovereigns owe him obedience and tribute, that vassalage was especially due from the English monarch in consequence of the surrender of the kingdom to the Pope by John, that Edward had clearly forfeited his throne by the non-payment of the annual tribute, and, in fine, that all ecclesiastics, regulars, and seculars were exempt from the civil jurisdiction, and under no obligation to obey the citation or answer before the tribunal of the magistrate. Singling out Wycliffe by name, the monk challenged him to disprove the propositions he had advanced. Wycliffe took up the challenge. The task was one which involved tremendous hazard, not because Wycliffe's logic was weak or his opponents unanswerable, but because the power which he attacked could ill brook 
to have its foundation searched out and its hollowness exposed. And because the more completely Wycliffe should triumph, the more probable it was that he would feel the heavy displeasure of the enemy against whom he did battle. He had a cause pending in the Vatican at that very moment. And if he vanquished the Pope in England, how easy would it be for the Pope to vanquish him in Rome? Wycliffe did not conceal from himself this and other greater perils. Nevertheless, he stepped into the arena. In opening the debate, he styles himself the king's peculiar clerk, from which we infer that the royal eye had already lighted upon him, attracted by his erudition and talents, and that one of the royal chaplaincies had been conferred upon him. The controversy was conducted on Wycliffe's sides with great moderation. He contents himself with stating the grounds of objection to the temporal power, rather than working out the argument and pressing it home. These are the natural rights of men, the laws of the realm of England, the precepts of holy writ. Already, he says, a third and more of England is in the hands of the Pope. There cannot, he argues, be two temporal sovereigns in one country. Either Edward is king or Urban is king. We make our choice. We accept Edward of England and refuse Urban of Rome. Then he falls back on the debate in Parliament, which presents a summary of the speeches of the spiritual and temporal lords. Thus far Wycliffe puts the estates of the realm in the front and covers himself with the shield of their authority but doubtless the sentiments are his. The stamp of his individuality and genius is plainly to be seen upon them. From his bow was the arrow shot by which the temporal power of the papacy in England was wounded. His, if his courage was shown in not declining the battle, his prudence and wisdom were equally conspicuous in the manner in which he conducted it. It was the affair of the king and of the nation, and not his merely, and it was masterly tactics to put it so, as that it might be seen to be no contemptible quarrel between an unknown monk and an Oxford doctor, but a controversy between the king of England and the pontiff of Rome. And the service now rendered by Wycliffe was great. The eyes of all the European nations were at that moment on England, watching with no little anxiety the issue in conflict, which she was then waging with a power that sought to reduce the whole earth to vassalage. If England should bow herself before the papal chair, and the victor of Crashy do homage to Urban for his crown, what monarch could hope to stand erect? And what nation could expect to rescue its independence from the grasp of the tiara? The submission of England would bring such an accession of prestige and strength to the papacy that the days of Innocent III would return and a tempest of excommunications and interdicts would again lower over every throne and darken the sky of every kingdom as during the reign of the mightiest of the papal chairs. The crisis was truly a great one. It was now to be seen whether the tide was to advance or not. The decision of England determined that the waters of papal tyranny should henceforth recede, and every nation hailed the result with joy as a victory won for itself. To England the benefits which accrued from this conflict were lasting as well as great. The fruits reaped from the great battles of Crashy and Poitiers had long since disappeared. But as regards this victory won over Urban V, England is joying at this very hour the benefits which resulted from it. But it must not be forgotten that, though Edward III and his Parliament occupied the foreground, the real champion in this battle was Wycliffe. It is hardly necessary to say that Wycliffe was non-suited at Rome. His wardenship of Canterbury Hall, to which he was appointed by the founder, and from which he had been extruded by Archbishop Langman, was finally lost, 
his appeal to the Pope was made in 1367, but a long delay took place, and it was not until 1370 that the judgment of the Court of Rome was pronounced, ratifying his extrusion and putting Langman's monks in sole possession of Canterbury College. Wycliffe had lost his wardenship, but he had largely contributed to save the independence of his country. In winning this fight, he had done more for it than if he had conquered on many battlefields. He had yet greater services to render to England, and yet greater penalties to pay for his patriotism. Soon after this, he took his degree of Doctor in Divinity, a distinction rarer in those days than in ours, and the Chair of Theology, to which he was raised to extend the circle of his influence and pave the way for the fulfillment of his great mission at the center of a new age. You've been listening across the border. My name's Nicholas, and next time we meet, we're going to engage Wycliffe's battle with the mendicant friars. May the Almighty bless you and keep you until we meet again.